So th this is a semi-analytical solution. Uh, it's useful. The reason we care about it mainly is that it's useful for verification of numerical model. It's got several assumptions. Two-phase flow, oil and water, 1D, Incompressible fluids, no capillary pressure, or gravity. No sources or sinks. Initial conditions and boundary conditions. The core is initially saturated with water at the residual water satur saturation. say that saturation of water initially, SWI, is equal to the saturation of water residual, SWR. We have a constant injection rate. We're going to use Q at x equals 0. Constant production rate Q at x equal to L. So we're just to visualize our 1D core, we're going to push water in and we'll flow out oil. You might recall from your previous class that you know the solution to this looks something like this. So this is this is what we're after, right? So there's some sort of exponential decay out to the water the saturation of the water front, which we'll call SWF, and then there's a sharp discontinuity, a shock right there, down to the residual water saturation. And this moves. This moves from you know, your left to right with time. So we're going to start with the mass balance equation for water. We derived last time. There's no sources or sinks. Also, we said the fluid is incompressible, but also the rock is incompressible. So the fluid incompressibility implies that BW is a constant. The rock compressibility implies that the porosity is a constant. So in that case, we'll move both of those outside the derivatives, and then the BWs will cancel. 
if we look at the velocity of water, that's the Darcy velocity. So that's going to be the flow rate of water over the area. And we're going to say that the flow rate of water is the total flow rate times the fractional flow. Right? So the fractional flow is the percentage of water that is flowing of the total flow. Right? And then the total flow times the fractional flow of water. Over the area. Now the total flow is a constant. The total flow is a constant. So plugging that back into the equation, we get this. Now, we also know that the fractional flow is a function of saturation, right? sort of by definition. Right? I said the fractional flow is the percentage of the total flow that's water. Therefore, it's a function of the saturation of water. Right. And so if we use then use the chain rule, divide through by phi also. So we divide through by phi, use the chain rule. We have that. Now, the saturation of water is a function of x and time. So let's investigate a differential change in the water saturation. Again, just using the chain rule. that. Now what we're looking for is a velocity front of constant saturation. We're trying to find the velocity front of constant saturation. So if the saturation is a constant, then there's no change. There's no differential change in saturation. So that's equal to zero. Or under this assumption of constant saturation, that's equal to zero. And so then we can do something. We're going to uh, we're going to solve this equation, and it'll look funny how we solve it. But we're going to solve this equation for dx dt. And again, that's evaluated at the constant saturation. So dx dt, you know, the, the, the x is the position, the position along. So the time rate of change of position of the saturation front, that's the velocity. Right? So that's the velocity. Right? Now, let's go back to this equation here. So, th so this was just derived by just, just investigating a differential change in the saturation of water, understanding that it's a function of x and t. Right? And so we came up with this relationship. Let's go back to this equation and notice that if I, if I just divide through by this, right? if I divide through by that, 
then I get something that, you know, this looks like that. Therefore, therefore, the velocity must equal this. And notice there's two negative signs. There's a negative there and a negative there. So those are going to cancel. So that ultimately we get the velocity of the constant saturation front is equal to Q over A phi partial F partial SW. And then for convenience here we'll introduce some dimensionless variables. XD is just equal to X over L. And D, TD is equal to QT over... That's defined as, in words, the pore volume injected over the pore volume of the core. XD is a dimensionless distance. TD, again, uh, if you look at the denominator, that's clearly the pore volume of the core, or the porosity times the area times the length. And then if, you're, if Q is a rate of pore volumes per time, if you multiply that by time, then that's, total, that's the pore volumes, right? Pore volume injected. And so then, you know, our equation. And we can easily integrate that. We can easily integrate this with the recognizing that XD is equal to zero at T equals zero. And if we do that, then XD is equal to TD So this is the, the velocity, the, the, the dimensionless velocity of the saturation front is equal to the partial of the fractional flow with respect to the saturation of water. And then XD, of course, at time t equal to zero, whether it's dimensionless or not, the, the shock front, right, the is, is at the boundary right, at XD equals zero. So then just integrating it, we get that. So then, you know, we, we basically, you know, have now, you know, if we want to ultimately plot saturation versus distance at a given time, right, all we need is this, the derivative of the fractional flow with respect to the saturation of the water. And so the way we come up with the fractional flow, right, the, fra the fractional flow is just what I said it is earlier, right? It's the, it's, the it's the fraction of the water flow rate with respect to the total flow rate. So the total flow rate is the flow rate of the oil plus the water. So it's just the flow rate of the water divided by the flow rate of the oil plus the water. And if you plug in Darcy's law to those equations, then everything cancels except for the relative permeabilities and viscosities, okay? Because the area is the same, the pressure gradient is the same. Well, the, you know, the pressure gradient is the same because there's no capillary pressure, right? So the pressure of water is the pressure of oil. 
And so the pressure gradients are the same, and everything cancels. And you just get that relationship over there. So you can come up with a fractional flow water versus water saturation curve just from the relative permeability information and the, and the fluid viscosity information. So you take your relative permeabilities, Brooks Corey or whatever, and you plug that in, right? You know, this could be discrete data, right? Could it could literally be data from the core flood, the sample, whatnot. And uh, you take this and you plug it, run it through that equation, and then you get this equation, the fractional flow. And what we want is the derivative of the fractional flow with respect to saturation. Okay. Now, given that this could be, this is I'm just going to go on a little tangent here and aside. Given that this could be discrete data, this is going to be discrete data. So while, while I have this drawn as a smooth curve there, it's, it's really points. Right? So we have to take the derivative of discrete data. You ever done that before? How do, you, how do you take the derivative of discrete data? You can finite difference it. That's one way. And a center difference approximation would be better than a forward or backward, right? Just because more accurate. But don't do that. <laughs> you know, when we use the finite difference approximations in class to develop the discrete equations, we're finite difference in functions, right? That just according to the theory assumes some continuity in the solution, therefore they're smooth, right? They, those derivatives exist if the model's valid, right? Of course, in, a, in the lab, you're measuring things. You don't, you don't have that assumption of smoothness or continuity. And so that discrete data, e even though it's sort of when you draw a line through it, it looks like a smooth curve, there can be little jumps in there. Whenever you d differentiate discrete data directly like that, it's going to amplify any sort of noise. You're gonna, your data is going to become noisier. So that's the opposite of integration. When we, we routinely integrate discrete data, right? You remember trapezoid rule, Simpson's rule? Th that's a routinely integration of discrete data, the area under the curve. That's actually a filtering, has a filtering effect on the data. But if you try to differentiate discrete data like that, then it's gonna, you're, you're going to get even noisier results. And so what, we, what, what the, the correct thing to do then is to interpolate a polynomial. Right? So you take any point and say if you wanted to interpolate a quadratic for it, you'd need to take three points. So at any point, you take its neighbor to the left and its neighbor to the right. And then you have enough information that you can interpolate a polynomial, or at least a quadratic polynomial. Right? If you want a, a be, you know, if you want a better approximation, you could go cubic. Right? In that case, you need four points, and you can go on and on and on. So the right way to interpolate, or to take the derivative of discrete data, is to interpolate a polynomial through the data, and then take the derivative of that polynomial. Right? That's that's the better way to do. So then, just in summary, to generate at a given t TD, right, at any time, you can generate the saturation profile. So if you actually want to see a visualization of the saturation profile moving through the core, you have to do this procedure at multiple TDs, right? And that's why it's called semi-analytic. Really, to get the full visualization, you still have to use a computer, right? But the computations, you know, you're not solving you're not solving PDEs. They've already, you've already integrated them, in fact, by hand. It's, it's more just, you're just plugging in over and over. Uh, you're just iterating over discrete points, right? So you, you pick a time, you know, so you pick a time, create your dimensionless time, create your fractional flow curve from your relative permeabilities, then from the, sat, you know, well, Basically, from the saturation of, of uh, from the residual saturation, uh, I'm trying to say this, from from the initial saturation to the residual saturation, you're going to sweep over the values of s. So again, now you're iterating. You, you fix a time, you sample s, and then from that, in the in your fractional flow curve, you can compute what x is. Right. So you pick an s, you compute what x is, and you put a dot on the screen. 
right, in the plot. When you sweep over all the S's, you can plot a profile, right, for that time. And if you do that, this is what you get. Something's not right. We know there's a shock front. Over here, XDF is the, the dimensionless distance of the shock front. We know that should be a sharp discontinuity, but there's two values of saturation if you do what we just said. One at the top and one at the bottom. And so one of them is not physical. So let's see if there's something else we can look at. So we have our core. And we know somewhere in it there's a discontinuity, saturation front. It turns out that the equation, the conservation equations, mass, momentum, energy, they hold over <coughs> discontinuities. They hold over shock fronts. In fact, if you go to the literature, the the, 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 the what this is attributed to, and you'll see that the, uh, in lots of in physics and shock physics and lots of different areas, you'll see these, and the name for them is the, called the Rankine-Hugonio jump conditions. Right, it's a fancy name, but really it's just conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum applied over a shock. And so we can write, so if we'll, we'll say like if this is XDF, Okay, well, what we're going to do is we'll write, just like the regular mass balance equation, we have what comes in equals what goes out. Right. What comes in plus, uh, what comes in minus what goes out must equal accumulation. Right. It's no different here, it's just we're going to write, we're going to treat the shock itself like the control volume. And so what we'll do is we'll write, This guy evaluated, we'll call XDF minus. This is evaluated at XDF plus. And we have accumulation. some time increment. And so then, if we substitute for the flow of water, our fractional flows, then we get something like this. And again, we're writing this equation over the shock, and at the shock we know we know that the saturation goes from whatever it is at the shock front to the initial over zero distance, right? So that's where this comes from. And then just do some algebra. in terms of our dimensionless variables. 
so we have that equation, and from previous results, we have this equation. Both valid, right? This this comes from the sort of continuum conservation of mass. This comes from conservation of mass over the shock. And so if we look at this, this this suggests that this derivative should actually be this secant line. So I think a picture helps here. So the, the way we come up with the correct saturation of the front is by drawing a secant line via this equation. So basically, you draw a straight line from the initial, uh, from the initial saturation up to the tangent point of the curve. And that becomes the saturation of the water front. So that's that's the correct value. Okay. And so then we correct the procedure that we started early. Okay. So we're gonna compute the saturation of the front first, right? So you know where it is via the secant method on the fractional flow curve. And then for all saturations less than, or, or, I'm sorry, greater than the fret saturation of the front, you run through the procedure, right? So you compute an X and an S by via the differentiation of the fractional flow curve with, with respect to saturation, right? So you perform the previous procedure, okay? It's just now you stop when you get to the saturation of the water front. And then when you get to the saturation of waterfront, you know that there's a straight line down to the initial saturation. And so from that, you get something like this. So sort of pictorially, again, compute this point first, then start up there, pick an SFW, run through this equation, and find XD and plot a point. Do that for all points, you get this sort of exponential looking decay, and then at that point it goes down like that. And you have to do this right at, at every point in time. So if you actually want to see this thing move across, right, you have to do this at every time. And again, that's why it really takes a computer to do this, but it's still much faster. I mean, you know, here these are just function calls, right? I mean, once you have your, especially w once you have your your numerical differentiation of the fractional flow curve with respect to saturation, then, it, then it, these are just function calls. Right? So you're not actually solving an equation. It's, it's really already been solved. You're just plugging in the numbers. And so this is a good verification problem for a code. So you know, if we were to code up those equations earlier, you know, assume that there's no capillary pressure, assume there's no gas phase, you know, those were 1D equations, so we have a 1D reservoir. We should be able to, in the limit, in the limit as delta x and delta t go to zero, we should be able to solve, you know, get a profile that matches this exactly. So we'll stop there today. <laughs>